For the last couple of weeks, I've been announcing this thing called DM2, and people are wondering, what in the world is this all about? This, uh, I'm going to have Brett explain it, but we have seen a tremendous impact from his ministry. Brett has been involved in teaching the Word of God and missions for uh, over 30 years. In the early 80s, he went on the mission field with New Tribes Ministries. Some of you know of New Tribes Ministries. You know John Cross, who has spoken here at Schaefer Conferences uh, in the past, uh, who's the president of Good Seed Ministries, wrote the book, The Stranger on the Road to Emmaus. He was originally a missionary with New Tribes and taught the word there uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, in Papua New Guinea. And Brett was uh, work also with New Tribes, and for, what, 17, 18 years was down in the uh, upper Amazon in what would be southern, uh, southern Venezuela, working with uh, primitive tribes there. So he's been back in the States since about 2000, uh, lives down in Harlingen, and has a taking a lot of the things that he learned on the mission field in training uh, leaders, training Christians to teach, take the word out, be more effective in evangelism and communicating the word of God to people. And so he founded this particular ministry. Clay Ward has worked extensively with him. They've gone to Africa, done different things. They had a DM2 conference up in, uh, up at Preston City Bible Church in Connecticut this last year. Jeff Phipps taught part of that on, on Romans. So he's gone through the training and also been involved in, in teaching as well. So this is something that is important, I think, that we as a congregation need to take advantage of because we need to be training people for various ministries within the church uh, for not just the near future but the long-term uh, future. So this fits within a long-term goal and strategy that we have in the church for training future generations and for increasing the areas in which we can minister to one another. So I'm going to ask Brett to come up and give us a... Uh, pep talk on why we need to be here next month. Thank you, Pastor. Um, it is great to be here with you this morning. Uh, my name is Brett Nasworth. I uh, grew up here in Texas over in Orange and went off after I graduated from high school. I uh, went to Wisconsin to Bible uh, Institute with New Tribes Mission and met my wife there. She's Canadian. Uh, we can, continued our training in Mississippi and then linguistics in Missouri. And in 1983, we went to the mission field, and uh, as Pastor mentioned, we were able to go to work with tribal people out in the Amazon jungle, uh, the people called the Yanomamo people. And um, that's a little bit of their language, and uh, we taught the uh, tribal people the word of God in their in their language, and um, it was uh, very important, of course, that we had learned their culture, and so we did anthropological studies as well as linguistics, and we're able to uh, leave a New Testament um, through the through the ministry there. Of course, I, I worked on some of that, but uh, other people did a lot of the, the work on that. I, my work was more in the Old Testament, um, translating. But um, through all of that, and coming back to the United States in, 19, uh, in 2003, uh, I began to pastor Harlingen Bible Church in Harlingen, Texas, and pastored till 2010 when I felt the urge to get back into missions. You see, when I was a missionary, one of the things that really impressed my heart was the need for uh, missions to come home to the local church. Um, see, mission organizations, by and large, say, send me your money and your people, and we'll take care of missions for you. And what I feel like is that the Great Commission was not given to missionary organizations. Jesus didn't say, I will build my DM2, or I will build my New Tribes Mission, or whatever. The Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. And the focus, uh, you know, long after DM2 is, is dead and gone, if the Lord tarries, the church will be here. Because that is the focus of Jesus Christ in this dispensation. And so I think that any time we can be a blessing and an aid to local churches, and any time we can put into shoe leather missions in a local church, we're actually working in concert with what the Lord Jesus Christ is wanting to do in this world. He wants to use churches. His, his plan is to have churches on every corner of every city of the world, if he can 
And so missions is basically accomplishing in that. that. And so what we've, what we've devised with DM2 is a way, originally the idea was to go um, to the third world and train pastors and leaders who have never had the opportunity to go to Bible college or go to seminary. And so we, we devised training that would be highly replicable, that would be understandable, uh, because you know the 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 we're we're going through language barriers and such as that to to take it overseas. So what you find with DM two is a a highly understandable uh, teaching program. And of course we have uh, we have Romans in two parts, one through eight, nine through sixteen, verse by verse. We have First Corinthians one through eight, nine through sixteen, two parts, verse by verse. We have Galatians, Colossians. Uh, Hebrews now that we're working on together with Pastor Mark Musser. Uh, we've got a panorama series, which is a panorama of the Old Testament, which um, goes through the historical books of the Old Testament, branching off when we get to minor prophets and taking them in. We came and, and we did a life of Christ, which is somewhat of a harmony of the four Gospels. And uh, that's what we will be teaching here. Um, but we also have a panorama of the New Testament, which follows the history of the first 30 years of the, ch- of, the, of the church through the book of Acts. As we hit James, we jump out, go through James, come back to Acts. Go forward, Galatians, back to Acts. And, and so we, we try to put everything in its, in its chronological order following Acts. And then at the end, of course, there's several books that have to be taught, which were written after Acts was closed. Uh, but the... The idea is is that we want um, God's people to understand the word. So this has been highly successful overseas. Uh, in, in Bolivia, for example, right now as we stand here, there is a team of Bolivian pastors that are in Mexico, in Leon, Guanajuato in Mexico, and they're teaching a Romans workshop in, in a church there. Um, and they have pastors from the community that have come in from other churches and so they're replicating what we taught them. They've been to Peru. They've been invited to go to, um, to uh, various countries in South America. And uh, they're blowing the minds of seminaries uh, down there because of their global understanding in, uh, of the Word of God through this methodology. And what we, want, what we found is about three years ago, I came back from a trip and was explaining what was happening to my board of directors, and they said, they said, we need to do this here in America. And I said, um, hmm, uh, it won't work. And, and they were like, won't work? And I said, no. I said, Americans are lazy. <laughs> they won't sit for hours through training, through, through intensive Bible study, not day after day like that. Well, they said, we need to try anyway, and so we did. And working with Clay Ward, we, we held a couple of workshops there in Tullahoma, Tennessee, and from there it's, it's exploding is, is a good way to say it. Uh, um, we are being invited to go all over the place, which makes training you important because maybe God would have some of you um, become teachers of God's Word, and you may think, well, I'm, I've never been to seminary. I can't do this. Well, we do the work for you. Uh, you have to put uh, meat on the outline, but we have the outline worked up. So we've done a lot of the grunt work. You, you have to uh, take it and teach it. And, and I will um, tell you this, that it is effective across the board. We just had a youth workshop in the Rio Grande Valley as a test to see if, if youth from just everyday life would come and sit through Bible training. We taught them for five days. We did no... Uh, fun and games with them. They, the only thing they got that was fun was lunch every day. They came, uh, the, the, the attendees grew over the five days, eight hours a day of teaching. What we did, though, is we taught youth using college-age um, trainees that we had trained. And so very near in age, um, but um, it, it was amazing. The first hour, Pastor Jaime Garza of, of uh, Harlingen Bible Church, a church that I attend now, where I pastored before, taught the first hour on Monday morning. Kids were slouched, bent over. And we had Cody Hughes, 19-year-old from Harlingen Bible Church, college student, stand up and teach the next hour. 
every kid in that place came alive and stayed alive for five days. And if, if kids can do that, then you can too. And these were kids, some of them were unchurched. Uh, some of them were from Church of Christ that were willing to come and listen. So we gave, they heard the gospel clearer than they've ever heard it in, their li- in all of their lives. So I, I would just say this, that, that if you have um, the opportunity or make the opportunity, better said, to come and see this and experience it, you will not sleep. I'll give you 20 bucks if you fall asleep. Uh, because the, the, the nature, if you're taking notes, I mean, there's, there's a notebook and you fill in the blank. But the, the, the nature of the, of the way the training is done is, is just, it keeps you awake. It keeps you engaged the whole way through. And uh, you, you don't see the hours reeling by. We have how many teachers, Jeff, lined up for this time? Okay, eight teachers. So you're going to see teachers from many walks of life, from, from very skilled over here to uh, all the way down to Cody Hughes, who's 19 years old, will be at doing a couple of sessions. And you will be amazed and blown away what God can do. And what I really am encouraged about is Jeff went to, we did um, at Grace Bible Church here in Houston, we did a workshop. Jeff came as, uh, to, to do one. And then Jeff went with me to teach one in Preston City. And, uh, and now Jeff is leading one. And so that's kind of our goal. I, I, want to, I want to be able to disappear and have guys like Jeff understand this process and not need me. That's the whole point of disciple makers multiplied. We teach you with the idea that eventually you can go on to teach others without us. And uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And, um, and um, I would just, uh, there's much more I could say, but I don't want to take up Jim's uh, precious minutes that he has here. But if you have any questions, I'll be here afterward and would love to chat with you about it. And of course, Jeff knows more about it than I do. So uh, ask him if you have any questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. This is really something important. And he said something significant in the middle of that. He said, the issue is, are you just willing to be used by the Lord? You may say, I don't know if I can teach. I don't know what I can do. And I always go back to my first grade Sunday school teacher. Some of you knew her, know her. Uh, Ursula Kemp, she was a refugee, Jewish, born Jewish, raised in a Jewish family. They were refugees from Germany. They came, uh, she met a, a guy in, um, in China, in Shanghai, and um, they came to the United States. She ended, they ended up visiting at Baraka Church because she worked for a dentist who went to Baraka Church, and that's where I think she was saved. And about a year after she was going there, the person in front of her turned around and said, we're going to start a Sunday school class. See, they got so small, they didn't even have Sunday school for a while. A lot of you don't know that. And they turned around to her. Ursula hadn't been saved a year and said, I want you to teach Sunday school. She said, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Nevertheless, do it. And, And Ursula said, okay, I'm willing to be used by the Lord. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll start. She and Betty Theme wrote some of the best Sunday school curriculum that's ever been used in any churches anywhere over the next 10 years. Just because she was willing to say, I'm going to give God an opportunity to work in my life and to use me in some way. And that's the challenge for each of you to come to the DM2 conference. So everybody here knows Jim. I don't really need to introduce Jim Myers for a couple of new people. Jim and I have known each other uh, for a while. (laughs) Jim is a missionary in Kiev. He's been over in uh, first in Belarus, went over there in 93, and had, then went down to Ukraine. Uh, that's where I go every January to help him with the Bible college there and to teach. So Jim is going to come up and uh, teach us from the Word this morning. Good to be back. All right. Phyllis and I have uh, driven uh, close to 9,000 miles in the past six or seven weeks and have spoken to some two dozen groups around the country, all the way from Tennessee to 
California, up to British Columbia, um, and back across to Indiana. And uh, so we've crossed through quite a number of states. In some cases, we were very encouraged by what we saw. In other cases, it was discouraging. Some of the churches that we used to visit in years past have simply evaporated. They don't exist anymore. Where they had strong Bible teaching, they're now gone. And that witness in the community is now gone. Some of the churches that we visited are dying of old age. We went to one church. There were only five people there, and I was the youngest one in the room. So uh, in, in 10 years, that church will probably be dead of old age. They're going to die off, and they don't have anyone coming up. Uh, other churches have uh, gotten into all sorts of programs to try to encourage more people to come. But there are still sound Bible teaching churches out there. In some cases, they've got some young men who are doing uh, the pastoring and leading in the churches. That's encouraging. And we're still here, and God still has a purpose for us. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to uh, mention to you, uh, in Albuquerque, where we visited, spoken two churches there, we visited a ministry called Hosanna, and they have something that's called Faith Comes by Hearing. And the vision of the man that started that was to provide the Bible for people who didn't have the Bible, and they began doing these dramatized readings of the Bible. You may have heard some dramatized readings. Well, this is the group that started this, and now they have the Bible available in more than 800 languages. And the wonderful thing with the technology we have today is that you can get this on your telephone or on your iPad or on your computer, and you can listen to the Bible in your language. So I have some cards here that you're, uh, I'll just leave them up here. You can get one afterwards if you want to. Anyway, the, the website is called Bible is, Bible.is. Can you remember the Bible is? Okay. Bible is, you can download this app and you can listen to the Bible in just about any language that you can think of and several hundred that you don't know exist. But uh, the wonderful thing about this, it's available 24 hours a day all over the world. When we were there, the, the man showed us this big rotating globe at their center, and you can click on any place in the world on that globe, and it will show you how many people are listening to the Word of God at any moment in what language from these apps. So he clicked on the city of Kiev, and at that moment there were people listening to the Bible in more than a hundred languages. I didn't know there were a hundred different languages being spoken in Kiev, but people were listening in that many languages. He clicked on Saudi Arabia, and at that very moment there were thousands and thousands of people listening to the Bible in Arabic. Amazing. So uh, anyway, there is this uh, organization. You can get the app Bible is, Bible dot is, and download that. And anywhere you are, uh, you can just turn it on and listen to the Bible. Uh, and it, it's, it's very effective. Also, they have something uh, called the Bible Stick, where they will provide the Bible on a little MP3 player for military people, no cost. Uh, and that's also available. I've got some folders here uh, on how you can uh, go about uh, providing those for men in the military where uh, they can just take it with them. It's just a small MP3 player, but they can put it on and listen to, uh, to the Bible. We are going back to Kiev in about a week and a half. Things there are not looking good right now. Um, they are fighting in the east. The Russian government has said we are not going to give in to Russia. 
uh, and they have uh, a shooting war going on over there. Uh, a couple of thousand Ukrainians have been killed in the last a couple of months. There was another Ukrainian plane that was <coughs> shot down yesterday. Uh, Russian troops have been coming into Ukraine. In spite of all the denials, they are there. But uh, the Ukrainian people have said, this is our country. In all of this conflict, perhaps the, the greatest thing to come out of it, from our perspective, is the rise of nationalism in Ukraine. There's a difference between Ukraine and the Ukraine. Some people say, why don't you call it the Ukraine? Well, the word Ukraine means borderland. And to call it the borderland means it's appended to some other nation. So it's always been part of something else. It belonged to Russia, belonged to Poland, belonged to Lithuania, belonged to Mongolia. A lot of different people have run across Ukraine over the centuries, and it was the borderland. It's the border of our country. Now, I've been over there for better than 20 years. 20 years, I never saw an individual fly a Ukrainian flag, never. Never saw a business put out a Ukrainian flag. The only times we saw Ukrainian flags were on national holidays, or on some government buildings. But now, today, you can go over there and you can see people waving the Ukrainian flag. People are flying flags on their automobiles. You can see it in the windows of homes. Businesses are putting out the Ukrainian flag. There has been a rise of nationalism. And I think for the first time in their history, they are saying, we are a nation. This is Ukraine which is a nation. The Ukraine is an appendage, but Ukraine is a country. And they are saying, we are a nation, we are a people, and we are not going to be uh, subjugated again. Now, if Russia decides to invade, the great momentous changes in history are always brought about by individuals who have some vision of attaining power or fame, and it's usually individuals who, who make those momentous decisions about where they're going to go. I don't know about Vladimir Putin. He's one scary dude, and I, I don't understand how he thinks. I honestly don't. I've tried to read and understand how he thinks. Some people have said he wants to recreate the Soviet Union. I don't think he does. I think he just wants to have the power. And that what he wants from Ukraine, he doesn't want to own Ukraine. He doesn't want that to be the Ukraine, an appendage to Russia. He doesn't want the problems, too expensive. Ukraine has too many problems that I don't think he wants. But I think he wants to be able to control the government there, tell the Ukrainian government what to do. And he would also like to have <clears throat> many of the resources that are available in the east where they have the mining, they have the heavy industry, and he would also like access to all of the Black Sea, which is very important to Russia militarily. But I don't think he wants to own the country. But having said that, will he invade? Well, I don't know. He certainly wants what they have in the East. But I believe that this is in the Lord's hands. I'm very proud of the new president in Ukraine, the way he's conducted himself. He has shown a lot of wisdom and a lot of courage because there's tremendous pressure that has been put upon him. But he's been making decisions that have been good for the country. Do pray for Ukraine. Pray for this president. His name is Poroshenko. Also, the parliament over there, not all the bad guys left with the old president. Most of them are still in parliament. They backed down for a while, but... Now some of them are starting to assert themselves again and trying to go back to the old ways. I hope that they will not gain enough power to affect what's going on. They may. But at any rate, the solution 
is spiritual and not political. The solution is spiritual and not military. We have an opportunity right now to evangelize as never before when all of the great protests were going on, when they had 500,000 to 800,000 people in the city square in Kiev. There was also a lot of evangelism going on there. There was a prayer tent that was set up, and there was prayer around the clock, 24 hours a day for months. And we had people from our church who were going out in the crowd, passing out tracts, New Testaments, gospel literature, engaging people in conversations, telling them about eternal life through faith in Christ alone. And there have been prayer meetings that have been taking place in many cities around Ukraine. Now Christians are coming together from many different denominations, but they will come together to pray for the nation. So we are seeing some very positive things in this regard. Uh, is this situation going to affect our ministry? I have no idea uh, what's going to come in the future. There may be a war. There may not be a war. I don't know. Uh, things are not good economically. The exchange rate between the national currency of Ukraine and the dollar is lowest in history. And there has been about a 60% devaluation of the Ukrainian currency since the first of the year. Uh, it's hurting people. But uh, we haven't had any interruption of any of our ministries in Kiev as far as the Bible College or the church is concerned. However, a number of our Bible College graduates had started ministries in the East, and that has been interrupted. In, in a number of cases, uh, churches have been shut down. You should understand tens of thousands of people are fleeing from eastern Ukraine because it's dangerous. And as one young pastor said, you go out on the street and you see people out there with guns and you don't know who they are because the Russians that are there are not wearing uniforms that say Russia on them. Uh, and you don't know who these people are. And there has been shooting and there has been looting. In some cases with the artillery barrage, this has also been hurting civilians. So tens of thousands of people have fled from the east. They've come to Kiev or they've gone to other cities in the west looking for refuge. We also have an opportunity to minister among those people as well. <clears throat> so to this point, it hasn't affected us personally. Uh, we recognize that this is all in the Lord's hands. Uh, do pray for us, for our safety as we travel, uh, and that uh, we're going to be able to carry on the work there uh, uninterrupted. So I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for your support, your encouragement. And uh, <clears throat> I would say also that the uh, reports of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, I want to thank all of you who prayed uh, when you heard news that I had uh, some medical problems uh, up in the mountains. But it lasted uh, only for a few hours, and I'm as normal now as I ever was. So, <laughs> I would like for us to look at some things from the Word of God this morning. If you would, open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. I think that all of you are very familiar with the last part of Daniel chapter 9 that deals with the 70 weeks of Daniel. Great passage that we go to for instruction about where we are as far as God's plan for man is concerned, the future tribulation, and what will happen after that. But perhaps we're not so familiar with the first half of the chapter, and I'd like to look at some principles there. As we come to the Word of God, shall we pray? Father in heaven, I thank you that you've revealed to us everything that we need to know about you and your plan and your provision for us. 
I thank you that we have this revelation in writing so that we can study it. I pray that today your Holy Spirit would guide us into truth, challenge us by the things that we'll read, so that we might understand how we ought to live and think and speak, so that we can fulfill your purpose for us. And this I would ask in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> in the year 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar invaded Jerusalem for the first time. He took many of the young men, the young princes, the aristocracy of Israel, into captivity, took them to Babylon. Among them was a young man by the name of Daniel. Daniel was probably just a teenager at that time, but he was taken into slavery, taken to Babylon. Uh, he was emasculated. He was made a slave. And they tried to impose upon him the Babylonian culture. But Daniel remained true to the word of God that he had been taught. And his determination was he was going to live in a way that was pleasing to God, fulfilling the law of God. And God honored that. But Daniel is still in captivity, and Daniel is suffering in Babylon but he remained faithful to the word of God. God promoted him according to his plan. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Now, this is in the year 538. <clears throat> and the Medo-Persians had overthrown the Babylonians, just as had been predicted in Daniel chapter 5 at Belshazzar's feast with the handwriting on the wall. And Cyrus the Great was the Persian who appointed Darius the Mede to be king over Babylon. <clears throat> Verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So Nebuchadnezzar had invaded Jerusalem in 605. This, when Daniel is writing, is some 66 years later. This would mean that Daniel is probably in his early 80s. So now he is an old man. And he's reading Jeremiah. Now where he got a copy of the book of Jeremiah, I don't know because that was written after he was taken captive. But somehow he got a copy of Jeremiah, and he is studying the Word of God. He recognizes this is the source of wisdom. This is the source of knowledge. This is what I need to know in order to be able to orient to my life right now. And so he's studying the Word of God. And in two different places in Jeremiah, chapter 25 and chapter 29, Jeremiah mentions 70 years. After 70 years, God said, I am going to punish the king of Babylon. After 70 years of desolation in Jerusalem, I'm going to bring people back and restore them to the land. Daniel is doing the arithmetic, and he's saying, it's almost time. The end of the 70 years is coming. What do I do now? Ah, very interesting because in Jeremiah 29, if you hold the place here and just turn back to Jeremiah 29, and we'll go down to verse 11. Well, uh, we'll go earlier. In verse 10, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to, to you to bring you back to this, path, to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Many Christians today quote this verse, and yet this is a promise to Israel God says, I have plans for Israel to give you a future and a hope. You're going to go into captivity. You're going to be destroyed as a nation, but I have plans for you. 
plans for your welfare, for your benefit, for your blessing. And so even though things may be bad, God still has a plan for you. You may suffer, God has a plan for you, and a plan to bless you. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile." God is making promises to Israel. I'm going to send you into captivity in Babylon, but then I'm going to bring you back. But he's saying, you need to pray. You need to seek me. You want to be part of the blessing? You're going to have to come to me in prayer. Daniel reads this. He's studying Jeremiah. And in Daniel chapter 9... As Daniel reads that very passage, which we just read, in verse 3 of Daniel 9, I gave my attention to the Lord to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I have a responsibility, said Daniel. I need to be in prayer about this. And so he's very serious about this, and he demonstrates humility as he is going to pray in sackcloth and ashes, recognizing he has no basis for any arrogance, any pride, any boasting on his part. But, you know, Daniel is outstanding among all the men that you can study in Scripture. Daniel is different because there aren't any, aren't any sins associated with Daniel. We well, can read about Abraham. He failed. David, he certainly failed. Elijah, he failed. You can read about men, and you find that they're all sinners. You read about Daniel, and of course he was a sinner too, but there's no failure of Daniel recorded. I find him an amazing man. But he humbles himself, and he prays. And we find his prayer here in Daniel chapter 9. And it's an amazing prayer to me, and I think that in this prayer... We can also learn principles that will apply to us today and that we can apply in our praying for our nation. <clears throat> principles. Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God, confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, <clears throat> who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. He ascribes greatness to God. He worships. He recognizes the glory of God and that God is the sovereign. God is the one who is in control of history. He's the one who rules over the nations. He's the one who raises up rulers and brings down rulers. Daniel understands this, and he is going to bow before this great and awesome God. Now, in verse 5, I want you to notice, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, and rebelled, even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Now, who sinned? We. Daniel does not exclude himself, even though Daniel is not guilty of the sins that caused Israel to be judged by God and their dispersion. Daniel isn't guilty of those sins, but he says, we have sinned. <clears throat> He's not saying they have sinned. Oh, those bad people out there saying, we have sinned. And Daniel partakes both of the blessing and of the cursing that comes upon his nation. We have sinned. Independent of personal blessing and personal cursing, you are part of a national entity. Does God deal with nations? Oh, yes, he does. Very definitely, God has a plan for nations. Make no mistake about that. And you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, partake of national blessing and national cursing. 
independent of personal blessing and cursing. These things will come upon you. You may live a very godly life, and yet you are going to suffer national cursing. <clears throat> and Daniel says, we. If you look down to verse 8, open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. In verse 11, Indeed, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice, so that the curse has been poured out on us along with the oath which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. You can read about cursing and blessing in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 to 30. And we participate in that. The believer participates in verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. Now, when he mentions Egypt, this is the great standard of power uh, displayed by God throughout the Old Testament. We find this over and over again, reference to God bringing his people out of Egypt. That is a display of God's omnipotence, his power, what he had to do to deliver his people. It's also a demonstration of God's love and God's faithfulness. He kept his promise. Just as in Genesis 15 he promised Abraham, your, your descendants are going to be slaves in a foreign land, but I'm going to bring them back here. God kept his word. And so we find continual reference to the Exodus generation, or God, what God did at the Exodus, to show we can trust God. He has the power, and he has made promises. But when there is a failure to obey the word of God, this always leads to judgment. So Daniel prays, and he asks God to hear, to see, and to act. In verse 16, O Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your holy from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. Verse 18, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. For your own sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. I was very interested to, to read this section because he says, for your sake. And I thought back to the time when I was just a very young boy, and my grandfather used to pray, and he would close his prayer for Jesus' sake, or for your sake. I never understood that. What does that mean to close your prayer and say, we pray this for Jesus' sake, amen. I didn't understand. Daniel here is saying, do this for your sake. He's saying, do this, God, for your glory, so that you will be the one glorified in doing this. I find this very instructive. When it comes time to pray, why do we pray for what we pray for? Why are you praying and asking God to do things? I think most of the time our prayers are focused upon personal comfort. 
I'm hurting, I don't want to hurt, God take away the hurt. And it's personal. And I think it's all right. I don't want to hurt. God, please take it away. And I think oftentimes we are praying simply that God will make our lives comfortable. So we ask God's blessing. Why? So that I'll be comfortable. But the real motivation in prayer ought to be for God's sake, for his glory, that when we pray and ask God to do things, we ought to be focused on the fact that this will bring glory to God. God, you restore your people, you'll be glorified. God, I pray for my problems, and I'm praying that you will solve my problems because I will give you the glory. Even as David prayed in, in Psalm 51, his great prayer of forgiveness, or confession so that he would have forgiveness, and he's saying, I want you to do this so that you will be glorified. If you do this, I'm going to praise your name. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. But we pray that God is going to make it stop hurting. Oh, God, heal me. Why? Well, so I don't hurt? No, the prayer ought to be so that God will be glorified in doing it, so that God will get the credit. Father, you do this, people will know that I've been in this situation that's beyond human help, and you did it, and I'll make sure people know that you did it, and I'm going to give you the glory. And if we begin to pray in order to bring glory to God, that's going to change the way you pray about almost everything. Focus on giving God the glory. What's your goal in life? What's your aim? 2 Corinthians 5, 9, the Apostle Paul says, we make it our aim, our goal. Here's our focus, our purpose in life. We make it our aim to be pleasing to you. And I need to be thinking about my conduct in the nation. You want to pray for the president? Pray that God's going to be glorified. Nehemiah, chapter 9, I would encourage you to read Nehemiah, chapter 9, Ezra, chapter 9, Daniel, chapter 9. You can remember the three nines, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Daniel, all post-exilic books. That is, they were written after the exile. Well, Daniel's exilic. But Nehemiah, chapter 9, Nehemiah is praying Confessing the sins of the nation. That's what Ezra does also in Ezra 9, confessing the sins of the nation. But Nehemiah says, here we are. We're, we're in this land that God has given to us, but we're servants. We ought to be kings. We ought to be the ones who have rulership in our own land. But here we are servants in our own land. And he says, there are kings who rule over us that God set over us because of our sins. It's an amazing statement. We have rulers over us that God gives to us in accordance with the people. Perhaps you've heard me say it before. It doesn't matter who you've got in the White House. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. It really doesn't. If you could pick your dream team, Let's put in the White House who you want, and let's put in Congress who you want. If you could choose the whole lot of them, do you think it's going to change anything in this country? It will not. And I'll tell you why. Because we can withstand an evil government. We cannot withstand an evil people. It's not going to change anything to get different people in office. Oh, say, oh yes, it would. No, it wouldn't. Because we have people who are not going to follow the will of God. And we're going to have judgment. And where it has to start is right here in the local church with people being focused on pleasing the Lord with their lives, not with being comfortable. And we are here for a purpose. And we need to understand what that purpose is. We need to be salt and light. Now, to do this, we've got to make disciples. We've got to be telling people about Jesus. I don't want to talk about Jesus. People will think I'm strange or a fanatic or, you know, it's not so safe to... 
We, we cannot be fearful of that. We need to be telling people about their need for salvation. But oftentimes, we don't really care about that. We just want to be comfortable. In my neighborhood, I want to be comfortable. I don't want to stir up the neighbors. I don't want them to think I'm a religious fanatic. Going to church is all right. That's kind of neutral. You can do that. But when you start talking about Jesus, when you start talking about eternal life and salvation, that's different. And really what we want from our neighbors, we're not really concerned about their eternal destiny. If they go to the lake of fire, well, that's, that's too bad. But we're not really concerned about that. We just want them to be good neighbors. I want them to keep up their house and so on. I want them to be polite and not play music too loud. And I just want to be comfortable. And we are here, and we have a purpose, and we need to be focused on fulfilling that purpose. And even more so, I believe that this nation is under judgment today, and it's going to intensify, but we're still here. We are here. And I believe, just as you read in Jeremiah chapter 18, if any nation will turn to the Word of God and begin to live by the Word of God, then God will withdraw the judgment that he intends to bring on the nation. That's a promise that applies to any nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now, we have rulers that have been set over us because of our sins. And we can't be blaming those people. We have sinned. And while you may not be personally involved in the sins that are bringing the judgment upon this nation, nevertheless, we're going to suffer that. And we have to say, we have sinned. And therefore, we have to be part of the solution here. It's not simply that those people need to change, but we need to understand, what must I do in order to fulfill God's purpose? We need to do things for God's sake for his glory, to fulfill his plan, to fulfill his purpose. God raises up nations. He brings down nations. He's the sovereign ruler over all, and he can do what he pleases. But if his people will submit to him, live godly lives, and fulfill the commands that have been given to us in the spiritual life, I believe we can have blessing. You can have personal blessing in any case. And we may just be part of a, a small remnant, but nevertheless we can have personal impact as we walk according to the Word of God and do things for His sake. I'd like to introduce you to a poem it was written by Rudyard Kipling in 1897 for the 75th anniversary of Queen Victoria. It's called Recessional. The poem is a prayer. And it's a prayer about the nation. And it describes the two possibilities for even the most powerful nations in the world. There are armies, there are people who are fighting, that glory is going to disappear. Nations pass out of existence, and those nations who once stood firm for the Christian faith, they degenerate, and this prayer asks for God to spare the nation from either just forgetting about Christianity or passing out of existence. And Kipling says that there is one thing that's going to endure, and this is what we've got to focus on, and the one thing that we have to focus on is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the one enduring factor. And so there's a refrain in this poem, lest we forget, lest we forget. Now, I know that some of you are old enough to remember Poppy Day. How many remember Poppy Day? 
Okay, yeah, those of my generation. And when, when we used to get the poppies, now this was for Armistice Day, which isn't celebrated here any longer, but it used to be they would uh, sell these little paper poppies and uh, you'd give, give a little bit of money, but this went for World War I veterans. And on the poppy, they, they had a little piece of paper that said, lest we forget. And it's interesting now on many monuments, not just in America, but in many places around the world now, you have monuments to uh, the fallen dead, the heroes of various wars, and it will say, lest we forget. They got that line from Rudyard Kipling's poem that we're going to sing. Now, Kipling wrote this poem to remind people that there's only one truly enduring truth. It's not our nation. This can pass. And even strong Christian nations can become pagan nations. And he's saying we should not be boasting in light of the permanence of God as if we're going to be here forever. So I'd like for us to, to sing this song. Now you know the tune. Uh, The tune is found in your hymnals, if you'll turn there, to 575. The tune is the Navy hymn, Eternal Father Strong to Save. And so, I'd like for us to... Turn to 575. If you need the, if you need the music, if you don't need the music, then the words will be on the screen here. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing the recessional. God of our fathers, known of old. Lord of our heart, from battle line, we use all hope and we hope the vineyard over palm and light. Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget the. Oh, 
pray that indeed we will not forget that ancient sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us so that we might have forgiveness of sins, that we might receive the gift of eternal life. We know that it is not by anything that we have done, but because of your mercy. We recognize that we do not deserve your blessing, and yet you have poured out grace upon us. Father, may we not forget the whole basis for our existence. May we not forget why we are here, that we are not here for our own comfort and ease. We are here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. May we humble ourselves. May we come before you, as it were, in sackcloth and ashes with true humility of heart to ask for your mercy upon this nation. Surely we deserve your judgment, but we are still here because you still have a plan for us, and I just pray that today, all across this nation, over many pulpits would come the word that people need to hear, that people will be saved, that your children will be challenged about how we ought to live, what we ought to be doing to fulfill the purpose for which you have left us here as individuals and as a nation. We have sinned. And yet, Father, we ask for your mercy, that your name not be blasphemed. Our money says in God we trust, but for many people the God is the money. May we truly trust in you. May we demonstrate this in the lives that we live. I thank you so much that you have called us into your service, that you have gifted us, that you have qualified each one of us for ministry, that you have made us ambassadors for Christ. May we be worthy ambassadors here in the devil's world. May we be blameless children of God. May we be lights shining in the darkness, even in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And may we do these things for your sake, not for ours, but for your glory. I thank you that we have freedom yet in this country to proclaim Jesus as Savior. May we take advantage of this freedom. We have freedom to assemble, to worship you openly. And Father, I pray that you will keep us free, that we might continue to preach the gospel, to preach the unchanging truth of your word, that we might continue to publish and distribute Bibles in so many hundreds of languages, and that we might continue to send out missionaries to take your word, your gospel, to those who have not heard. I thank you so much for this church. I pray that you will continue to bless it. May it be a light in this community. May you be pleased to work in it and through it for your own purpose, your own glory. For all of these things, we give thanks for your grace, your love to us. For Jesus' sake, in his name we pray, amen.